It's a great joy to be able to share another Glad Tidings Our program with you. We trust that today's program with its ministry will really touch your hearts, inspire you and challenge you. It is a different type of program today because we have got an entire program that we want to share with you that Yvonne is going to introduce just now. So let's get ready for her and for the program that follows after her introduction. When Carol, our older daughter, went to university in Edinburgh, she started attending Crubbers Christian Centre. That's on the Royal Mile. It is a lively, outgoing church, and she became involved right away in the music ministry and in the children's work. Sometime later, she met Andrew there, and he is now her husband. Today, we're going to let you watch a recent service in Crubbers, which records the amazing beginnings of that church 150 years ago. The narration is done by Mr Eric Scott Sr., who, along with his wife Nancy, are long-time friends of ours. They were a great encouragement to Andrew and Carol in their student days. Mr Scott also relates some of the stories behind the old hymns, which Andrew will sing. This is our full programme this week, as we just couldn't break it up midway. Eric will bring a short epilogue at the end. Well, the mission began way back in 1858, May 1858. And there was a man, Reverend James Gall, and three other uh, clergymen, and they did a survey of the Royal Mile in the old town of Edinburgh. They discovered that people were unchurched. They said that at least 7,000 children were completely unchurched. And so they decided to ch start a children's work. They thought that's the best way to get into homes. And so um, James Gall, he rented uh, what had been an atheist club at the bottom of Carabas Close, just further up the high street. And uh, it had previously been with the atheists, and it was called the Celebrated Cathedral of the Prince of Darkness. And uh, that's not very encouraging. <laughs> Paid 20 pounds a year for it. But anyway, they invited children. And they got 500 children packed into that hall. And they needed a superintendent. Now, there was a young businessman by the names, uh, name of Alexander Jenkinson. There's a marble bust of his on the first landing up to the York Hall. And uh, he um, started the firm Edinburgh Crystal, became a worldwide name. He had a shop at the east end of Princess Street and he had a factory at the top of Leith Walk. And he had 150 girls and they all knew the Lord, they were all saved. And Alexander Jenkinson said to them, I want you girls to come every Sunday afternoon and teach these children. And they did that. It started well. But you know, in those far off days, they used to only sing the Psalms. And they had about four or five tunes for all of the Psalms. And the kids couldn't really understand the words. And Alexander Jenkinson says, we want to start singing hymns. And there was a great man of God, Horatius Bonner, had a church in North Leith and uh, he wrote the hymns. And so he asked if he would become involved in the work and he was glad to. That was the beginning of a wonderful association with Andrew, uh, Horatius Bonner and Carabas Close Mission. And they started to teach the children the hymns. And there was one hymn at Carabas which was probably the favorite and it was the testimony of the great man, Horatius Bonner. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come on to me and rest. Lay down, thou weary one, lay down thy head upon my chest. I came to Jesus as I was, 
Weary and worn and sad I found in him a resting place And he has made me glad I heard the voice of Jesus say Behold, I freely give The living water Thirsty one, stoop down and drink and live. I came to Jesus and I drank of that life-giving stream. My thirst was quenched, my soul revived, and now I live in Him. I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's light. Look unto me, thy morn shall rise, and all thy day be bright. I looked to Jesus, and I found in him my star, my sun. And in that light of life I'll walk till traveling days are done. About seven years later, 1865, there was a young man came from Bathgate. He came, first of all, to study medicine and eventually became Professor Sir James Young Simpson. And he joined uh, Carabas Close Mission. He knew about the work, and so he was delighted to be involved. But you know, when he was a young man, he was studying medicine. And part of the course, he had to go into the operating theater. And uh, they wheeled a man in, strapped to this table, and uh, they began to sew off his leg without any anesthetic. And of course, it was a terrible experience for young James. And he said, I couldn't possibly be a doctor and do that kind of thing. And then he thought, perhaps there's a means where we could put these people to sleep. And so he started experimenting with a drug called chloroform. He actually almost killed himself uh, experimenting with it. And then he discovered how to use it. He had a rather uh, strange aunt and in those days, there used to be a lot of fog in Edinburgh. And she called it James home one day. And uh, she said, you know, she said, I can deal with the fog. She said, I have a veil. And when I put the veil down, I just breathe fresh air. And James said, that's the answer. And he experimented. He ripped the, the uh, lace off one of his wife's underskirts. And he tried it out with his friend. And it worked. And you know, that method was used for many, many years. And it became famous. But the strange thing was that, you know, James had a lot of opposition. First of all, for the medical people. And then he even had opposition from the clergy. They said to him, you see, God is sovereign. And if God wants to have your leg cut off, Without going to sleep, you'd better just get on with it. But you know, he, he knew his Bible. He'd memorized reams of the scripture. And he said, well, you know, it's interesting. Our Heavenly Father was the first one to carry out an operation on Adam. Put him to sleep. <laughs> and so uh, James Young Simpson won the, won the battle. He had a wonderful testimony. You know, there was an occasion when there was a, a meeting held, a dinner, and a lot of the dignitaries from Edinburgh were there, and there was a reporter. And he said, I'd like to ask you a question, Professor. What was your greatest discovery? Expecting to hear chloroform, the, the discovery of chloroform. He said, my greatest uh, discovery was to know that I was a big sinner, a bad sinner but I had a great savior. And so he helped the mission. Do you know he started a surgery and he treated 7,000 people every year at his own expense. 
Now, just at this time, in America, in Chicago, there was a young man called Dwight Lyman Moody. And he got wonderfully saved, and he started a Sunday school. He had 1,500 children at the Sunday school. Became known as an evangelist. Had a very inadequate schooling. Didn't go to seminary or Bible college. But he used to read through God's Word every year. And he'd spend a couple of weeks during the summer, and he'd read through it nonstop. He called it tuning the instrument. And God used him wonderfully. Got to be known as an evangelist. And he was invited to a convention in Indianapolis. And so Moody, in his usual way, said, we'll have a prayer meeting, six o'clock tomorrow morning. And so they gathered. And the meeting didn't go very well. I think everyone was too sleepy. And suddenly a young man stood up and started singing. And this is what he sang. Immediately, Dwight Moody made a beeline for him. He said, what's your name? He said, it's Ira Sankey. He said, are you married? Yes, I have a family. Do you have a job? Yes, I have a good job, a government job. And Sankey, uh, Mr. Moody said to him, well, you're going to have to leave it. <laughs> you're going to have to come to Chicago. I've been looking for you for years. And Ira Sankey said, well, I'll need to speak to my wife. <laughs> But anyway, later in the day, he sent a postcard, Moody sent a postcard to Ira Sankey. And he said, I want to meet you at a certain uh, street corner. And uh, we'll have an open air meeting. And uh, so they met there. And he watched how Moody operated. There was a hardware shop. And he borrowed a big wooden box. And he said, now, Mr. Sankey, he said, I want you to stand on that box. And he said, you, you uh, composed a tune for Isaac Watts' hymn. I want you to stand up there and sing it. And he said, that'll get the crowds coming. And this is what he sang. Soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb. And shall I fear to own his cause, or blush to speak his name? In his name, the precious name of him who died for me. Through grace 
I'll win the promised crown Whate'er my cross may be Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the flood? Is this vile world a friend to grace? To help me on to God Sure I must fight if I would reign Increase my courage, Lord I'll bear the toil, endure the pain Supported by thy word In his name, the precious name Of him who died for me Through grace I'll win the promised crown Whate'er my cross may be Thy saints in all this glorious war Shall conquer though they die They see the triumph from afar By faith's discerning eye In his name, the precious name Of him who died for me Through grace I'll win the promised crown Whate'er my cross may be. Sankey did pay a visit to Chicago. They went to prisons, they went to churches, and they sang and preached together. And you know, those two men, their hearts were knit together. And uh, God wonderfully, wonderfully used them. Now, Carabas had been going on, and there'd been a continuous revival in Carabas' close mission. And Moody had heard about it. And uh, he heard that they had an open air meeting every night of the week, seven nights of the week. And they had a prayer meeting, and some nights they'd have three gospel services. And uh, Moody said, That's just up my street. And so he visited them one wet, cold Edinburgh evening to see if the open air people would be there. And they were there. And uh, his heart was knit to them. And he said, listen, I want you to book the biggest auditorium in Edinburgh and we'll have some special meetings. And uh, they booked the Free Church Assembly Hall at the top of the mound. But there were some problems. Do you know there were a lot of theologists didn't like Moody's preaching. He used to, there used to be a clock often in the hall, and at 25 past nine, he said, anyone who's here wants to put their trust in the Lord Jesus, before that minute hand reaches the half hour, they can be saved, passed from death to life. And you know, there were some theolog theologians didn't like that. And also, he preached on the Lord's return, the rapture, the dead in Christ rising first. Then we who are alive and remain caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And you know, there was a conness wrote in a newspaper, if Moody preaches that stuff, he'll lose all of his credibility. And Moody says, well, the Bible teaches it. And so if it teaches it, I'm going to preach it. And he preached it, he did. And then there was Mr. Sankey and his little organ. They didn't like that. They call it the kiss to whistles the chest of whistles. And they used to say, you know, the devil's in the pipes. And so they had the very first night in the Free Church Assembly Hall. And it went quite well until Mr. Sankey sat down at his little organ. And there was an, the place was packed to the rafters. And there was an excitable lady right in the middle of the hall. She jumped to her feet and shouted at the top of her voice, let me out. She says, what would John Knox say to the likes of Don, pointing to the little organ? And it caused quite a disturbance. And so they were a wee bit disheartened. And so the next night they met again. And that night, Horatius Bonner got a seat right next to the little organ. And Mr. Sankey came up and he was going to sing. And he said, first of all, I'd like to pray. And he says, I pray that God might help you to understand the message in this song. He said, it was written by a very dear friend of mine, Mr. Moody's, Philip Bliss. And he sat down 
And he sang this beautiful hymn. of that song was electric. That was the beginning of a tremendous time of blessing in Scotland as well as Edinburgh. And you know, Mr. Sankey set Scotland singing, wrote all the lovely gospel hymns. Uh, And there was one hymn that became a great favorite, and it was born here in Edinburgh in the assembly halls just up the top of the mound. And Mr. Moody and Mr. Sankey that had been in Glasgow had some great meetings, spoke to tens of thousands of people. And they were coming back in the train, and Mr. Moody was uh, absorbed with his sermon that he was preaching that night in Edinburgh, and he was preaching on the Good Shepherd. And Iris Sankey was looking at a Sunday school newspaper, and he noticed a poem about the Good Shepherd, written by an Edinburgh lady called Elizabeth Cleffin. And he read it to Mr. Moody, but... Moody was too engrossed in his sermon. And anyway, they got to the assembly hall, and Moody preached, the good shepherd. And when he'd finished preaching, he said to Mr. Sankey, sing something suitable. And Sankey remembered about this little poem. He'd torn it out of the newspaper and pushed it into his waistcoat pocket. And he thought to himself, I'll try and sing that. And he didn't know a tune for it, but he put the words up on the music stand and he he, he struck the chord A flat major. And he started to sing, and this is what he sang. out on the hills away far off 
from the gates of gold away on the mountains wild and bare away from the tender shepherd's care away from the tender shepherd's care lord thou hast here thy ninety and nine are they not enough for thee but the shepherd made answer this of mine has wandered away from me and though the road be rough and steep i go to the desert to find my sheep i go to the desert to find my sheep but none of the ransomed ever knew how deep were the waters crossed, nor how dark was the night that the Lord passed through ere he found his sheep that was lost. Out in the desert he heard its cry, sick and helpless, and ready to die, sick and helpless, and ready to die. But all through the mountains, thunder riven, and up from the rocky steep, there rose a glad cry at the gates of heaven, rejoice, I have found my sheep and the angels echoed around the throne rejoice for the Lord brings back his own rejoice for the Lord brings back his own You know, there was revival in Scotland. The, there's a, an account of John Brown's shipyard where they built the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth. And they said that they could hear the workmen singing above the banging of the riveting, dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, and dare to make it known. And you know, the, the crime rate went down by 50%. Why? Because lives were changed. But in 1883, Carabas lost their premises down Carabas Close. And uh, Moody said, you cannot run this mission on fresh air. He said, you'll need a new building. Now at that time, <coughs> Sir James Young Simpson's nephew, Sir Alexander Simpson, was the president of the mission. And Mr. Moody said, Alexander, he said, I want you to hire a horse and cart. And incidentally, get the biggest bed sheet that you can lay your hands on and bring it to the Royal Mile. I think he wondered what was coming. And Mr. Moody and Sir Alexander Simpson got onto the back of the cart, holding the bed sheet, and they went through all of the streets of Edinburgh. And people threw money into it. And they collected the sum of 10,000 pounds, equivalent to a few million in today's standards. And uh, they built Carabas from that. It was Mr. Moody's vision. And it's thanks to him, thanks to his vision, that we're sitting here tonight. And uh, the foundation stone was laid, and uh, Horatius Bonner was at Moody's right hand. And he prayed for this work. And then they all sang. Crowds, there were tens of thousands crowding outside on the road. They were climbing up lampposts, any vantage point, to see what was happening. And Mr. Moody laid the foundation stone. And they sang, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. On the 4th of March, 1884, and amazing how quickly this building was erected, they opened Carabas Close Mission. 
And Mr. Moody preached his fir the first sermon from this platform, and it was the text, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And folks were blessed. People were saved. You know, this building, after it was opened, they had 58 meetings every week. It was called the church with the ever open door. And it was reckoned, it was estimated that it reached to between eight and 10,000 people every week. So a tremendous work was done. Thank God for the vision that he gave to Mr. Moody. But there was a hymn, and Mr. Moody used this hymn at more meetings than he could imagine. And it's interesting how the hymn came to be written. And uh, he was in New York taking a, a, a series of meetings. And in America, there was an atheist called Robert Ingersoll. And uh, he used to follow Moody about. And he'd book a hall next to Mr. Moody's. And uh, he would say, I'm going to prove that Moody's a fool, that there's no God. And he would look at his watch and he would say, I challenge God to strike me dead in five minutes. He'd go on preaching. He was a very good speaker. Then he'd look at his watch. Oh, he'd say, six minutes have gone, and I'm still here. And uh, there was a young man, Will Thompson, in New York. He'd written a number of ballads, and they'd swept across America. And he was quite famous. And he wondered if he should go to Robert Ingersoll's meeting or to Mr. Moody's meeting. And he decided to go and hear Mr. Moody. Heard the gospel. Got wonderfully saved. And he approached Mr. Moody after the meeting. And he said, Mr. Moody, he says, I've committed my heart and life to the Lord. Mr. Moody knew who he was. He says, you're the songwriter, aren't you? He said, well, why don't you write a song for the Lord Jesus, thanking him? And after a lot of his meetings, Mr. Moody would say, Ira, Sing Will Thompson's hymn. And when he was on his deathbed, he met with his friend Will. And he said, Will, he says, I think there's more people come to the Lord through your hymn than all my preaching. That wasn't true, of course. Showed the generosity of that great man. But it was wonderfully used. And this is what Will Thompson wrote.
from me. Shadows are gathering, deathbeds are coming, coming for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. Oh, for the wonderful love he has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon. Pardon for you and for me. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling. Mr. Moody said that he sees this world as a sinking ship, but God's provided a lifeboat in the cross. And Moody said, it's my job to get as many people in that lifeboat as possible before the Lord comes again. And you know, that's why Carabas is here. Do you remember Mr. Moody's text? I, the Lord, do keep it. I will water it every moment. Lest any hurt it, I will keep it night and day. We thank God for his faithfulness. Amen. Now we give God all the praise and the honor and the glory for the message and the story that we have just heard. What a great work in that strategic place in the city of Edinburgh in Scotland. So it's a real Scottish theme in our program today. And we want all you dear friends in Scotland to really enjoy what you have heard shared, as Yvonne has said already, by Mr. Eric Scott and our son-in-law Andrew singing along with his wonderful music and ministry. So we praise God for what we have heard already. I've got an open Bible before me in my hands today. And it's open at Psalm 126. And here are the words in verses 3 and 4 of that psalm. The Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Amen. And I know God will bless his precious word to our hearts. Please join me as we just have a moment of prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for what we have heard already today. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. And we know today that you can do the same anywhere in the world. And we pray that great things will happen in these days, in this 21st century, as your word goes forth around the world. Bless the closing moments of our program today, and be glorified in what is said. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. Yes, the passage that I've just read to you is a reference to the delight that was on the captives' hearts as they came back from the Babylonian captivity after being away from their home city and homeland for 70 years. And the verse says, The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. 
And of course, that's an amazing story of how the people of Israel came back to Jerusalem, back from the captivity in Babylon. It surely was a great thing. But we have been listening today to a great account, a wonderful account, in that the Lord was working mightily in Edinburgh through those early days of Corrubber's mission on the Royal Mile in Edinburgh. Yes, we have to say again, the Lord has done great things, and he still is doing that even today. Indeed, we can add the words of the text, whereof we are glad. The ministry of Corrubber still stands as a living testimony in Scotland's capital city, Edinburgh. And the outreach which was birthed 150 years ago is still reaching lives today. And it's true to say that only eternity will provide the full revelation of all that has been accomplished for the glory of God. The people whose lives have been transformed by the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The missionaries that have crossed the lands and oceans of our earth to bring the message of Jesus Christ, the Savior of sinners, the sanctifier of his people, and the glorious ascended Lord at the Father's right hand. Oh yes, our great high priest, whoever makes intercession for us. And of course, there has been the financial support for the work of Christ's kingdom that has gone from corrubbers and reached around the world. If it was all put together, it is truly amazing. And only eternity, again I say, only eternity will reveal the full story. Thank God the story is still ongoing and will be until Jesus comes, as Mr. Scott referred to, that wonderful day when the bridegroom returns and the work that we're doing these days will then have its grand consummation. You know, we do serve a great God who specializes in doing great things. And if I was to take time, but I'm not going to do that today because I said to you to just be a little short epilogue, or Yvonne said that a few moments ago, he created all things. He did it by the word of his power. That's a great event, wasn't it? Yes, he spake and it was done. He upholds all things by the word of his power. He not only creates all things, but he is upholding all things. And praise God, greatest of all, as far as we are concerned, God gave his only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave him to be our Savior, the Savior of lost humanity. He gave his life as a sacrifice for sin. He provided salvation for a lost humanity. And there is no greater work than this. How wonderful the precious blood of Jesus is and the saving power of the cross. And the best of all is his kingdom shall know no end. Other kings come and presidents go and kingdoms rise and fall and empires rise and fall. But the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ will go on eternally. And people are coming to know this great Savior every day around the world. And we are glad. There's a hymn that says, To God be the glory, great things he hath done. I'm sure you know the hymn. It's a great hymn, and we praise God for it. And praise God, we are seeing the effects in lives that are being changed. Having said all that, I want to say too, in application to you who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, that life's greatest fulfillment is in being one with God in his plan and purpose for your life. Mr. Scott spoke about D.L. Moody. He spoke about Horatius Bonner. He spoke about James Simpson. These were people who yielded their time and talents to God for the service of Jesus Christ. And what an impact it has made on so many lives, even to this day, and of course until Jesus comes and the consummation of his great work on earth is complete. Praise God today. You and I can be part 
of that great, wonderful work of God. It was D.L. Moody, indeed, who, it is said, heard two people discussing one day, the world is yet to see what can be done through one life that is wholly yielded, totally yielded to God. And his response in his heart was, by the grace of God, I'll be that man. Yes, Mr. Moody, and the names of others who were identified in today's story that I've just mentioned, they surrendered their time and their talents to the cause of Jesus Christ. And Scotland is feeling the effect. And yes, around the world, the ripples that issued out from Corrubbers 150 years ago and then down through the succeeding ages. Praise God, it has been a profound impact to the ends of the earth. I think it would be an appropriate response from all our hearts today if we were to say, as Mr. Moody said, by the grace of God, I'll be that person totally yielded to God. I will surrender my time and my talents to the Lord. I will have his will for my life that through me he might make an impact in our world in this 21st century. Who knows what could be accomplished by one yielded life that might respond even to this challenge and to what we have heard today on Glad Tidings Hour. I trust the Lord will write all the profound impressions of His divine Spirit into our hearts today. And let me say, maybe that someone is listening today and you have never trusted the Lord Jesus as your Savior. You do not know Him. Well, this would be a great day for you to seek the Lord Jesus. Come just as you are. Come to the cross of Calvary. Look by faith and in true repentance because of your sin and sinfulness and in true and simple faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross, you can come to know our Savior, Mr. Moody's Savior and the Savior of others that we have heard about today. Oh, may the Lord draw you to himself. Now, we are going to have a great closing hymn today that looks forward, and it was the song with which they closed out the program that evening at Corrubber's Christian Mission just a few months ago. Oh, my comrades, see the signal waving in the sky. And the chorus says, Hold the fort, for I am coming. Jesus signals still, wave the answer back to heaven. By thy grace we will. Let's listen to it as they closed out that memorable evening on the Royal Mile back in the springtime of this year.
May God bless you and be with you. This is Eric Stewart saying God bless and watch over you until we present our next program next weekend in the will of the Lord. Bye-bye.